You may be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. It says, And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. I pray that because of me, or even in spite of me, this morning your word would be faithfully proclaimed. Amen. So Paul certainly knew his way with words, because throughout his various letters in the New Testament, we hear him deliver some pretty difficult messages to budding communities of faith. Again and again, Paul manages to offer gentle critiques and constructive feedback to churches throughout the ancient Near East. And at the heart, all of, these, all of his messages have the shared goal of helping believers grow in their journeys of faith. Paul wants, or wanted, continues to want, I guess, to help believers be more like Christ as they discover what it means to live as Jesus' disciples in the world. And I, I kind of wonder sometimes if Paul had any idea that his letters would be circulated around the world for generations and centuries to come. Did he have any idea that any time he wrote to the Corinthians or the Galatians or any other community, that the letter essentially had a BCC to every other person of faith? Like, imagine that. Imagine if you sent an email to someone and that email was read by basically all everyone everywhere for generations to come. Like, that's an astounding thing to consider. And this was before the days of, like, technology connecting us. These were actual letters being written. His messages were for a specific church at a specific point in history, but his words have implications for all of us. Paul's wisdom and teaching continue to guide us in the church today. And so with that in mind, it makes me wonder, what does the part of Paul's letter that we read this morning have to teach us? What does it have to say to us in the church? And this morning we heard part of Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. And as you might infer from me saying the first um, letter, things must have been really rough for the Corinthians because they got two letters from Paul. Not many people got two letters. It was mainly the Corinthians, the Thessalonians, and... Timothy, maybe? There's not many letters where they got two, but um, we actually heard another portion of the letter to the Corinthians a few weeks ago, and as I mentioned then, Paul is writing to a church that's in conflict, which is probably why they got two letters. They were embroiled in conflict. The Corinthians were caught up in arguments and divisions about church leaders. Reports made their way to Paul from the house of Chloe, announcing quarrels in their midst. Evidently, the believers in Corinth were splitting into different factions or kind of cliques based on their favorite leaders or preachers. Instead of simply claiming Christ, the believers were claiming leaders such as Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. And Paul addresses this conflict and division all throughout his letter to the church. And we see it come up in the short section that we read this morning. Our passage opened with Paul noting 
how he had to alter the way he spoke to the Corinthians because of their spiritual immaturity, essentially. This is actually part of what made me note Paul's uh, decorum at the beginning of my sermon, because he basically calls the Corinthians babies here. Paul says, I can't even speak to you as spiritual people because y'all are still people of the flesh, mere infants in Christ. He goes on to say that they're not even yet ready to receive solid food, which by the Academy of Pediatrics today would make them less than six months old. Um, Instead, they rely on the simple sustenance of milk. In spiritual terms, this means they're not yet yet ready to receive complex, difficult teachings about God. The Corinthians are not yet ready for meat and potatoes teachings. They still need the simple, basic teachings. And so Paul says he feeds them with milk, foundational truths perfect for nourishing new people of faith as they develop and establish a relationship with God. Paul even adds in verse 2 that they're still not ready yet for solid food. Um, They're still of the flesh, um, which implies like it's not just a past reality. This is a current reality for the Corinthians. He goes on to say that as long as there is jealousy or quarreling among them, they are of the flesh, behaving according to their human inclinations. Let's consider that again because that is a word for us in the church and the world today as well. As long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh behaving according to human inclinations? Snap, Paul. That is, that is a way to call us out. It was a way to call the Corinthians out and it continues to call us out in the church today. Because as long as our communities and world are ruled by conflict, division, and jealousy, we aren't really living as spiritual people, at least not fully. The way we polarize issues and divide into factions of us versus them is not of God. That's a human response, a human way of interacting with the world. I don't know what it would look like for Paul to send a letter to the modern church today, but I feel quite sure that we would get more than just two. Um, It would be a a series of sorts. Um, I'm convinced that Paul would be deeply grieved to see the deep divides and conflicts running rampant in the church today. Not only would Paul be grieved by these divisions, but I'm convinced that God is deeply grieved by these conflicts and divisions. After all, as Paul goes on to explain further, we were never meant to let the church become divided into factions. That's what the Corinthians were doing. They were devolving into disunity because of a misplaced focus on church leaders. The Corinthians were claiming Apollos or Paul or others because of the role each of them played in helping them come to believe. But as Paul reminds them, each of those leaders was only doing the work that the Lord had assigned to them. None of the leaders in the church at Corinth were revolutionary or noteworthy, or at least not in comparison to Christ. Paul goes on to explain how all of the individual leaders were working together with God to help the new church grow and flourish. Paul says that he planted the seeds and Apollos watered them, but ultimately, God is the one that gave the growth. Paul suggests that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters are anything in the grander scheme of things. Each of them does have a common purpose and will receive wages according to their labor. And yet the focus is not on the solitary work of individuals. The focus is on the collective work of all those individuals coming together. The focus is how all God's servants are working together in God's kingdom. We are all God's field, God's building. That includes all denominations, all conferences, all congregations. Like That's why in our creeds, when we say them, we talk about the 
the holy Catholic Church. That's not talking about Catholic as in like Roman Catholic or the, the people that have Pope, the Pope. Um, holy Catholic Church is about the universal church, all churches everywhere, which includes all different expressions of Christian faith around the world. All of us are working together to grow the kingdom. We are all co-laborers working together to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And because of our calling to work together as God's servants, we would do well to remember this teaching from Paul about how to do the work the Lord has assigned to each of us. I've of, I have often found great solace and encouragement from these words. To me, there is great reassurance in remembering that each of us is given different tasks as we follow Christ in the world. No one is called to do the work of building God's kingdom on their own. In fact, by nature, we cannot do this work alone. While I hated them in school, this is a group project. The work of building God's kingdom is something we do in community. We are all in this together, laboring with one another as we seek to love God and love our neighbors. I'm always grateful that we are called to do this work together because when you look at the world around us, it's easy to become overwhelmed by just how broken the world is, by how broken the world can be. At any time a news headline comes up on my phone, sometimes I just like have to sigh before I read it because almost always it's something heartbreaking or devastating. The world is in desperate need of God's healing and grace. The world is in desperate need of reconciliation and peace. The world is in constant need of God to do a new thing in our midst. And when we consider the sheer magnitude and weight of our need, it can be easy to become overwhelmed. We can even feel crippled into inaction. So the good news is that, again, we are not called to do this work alone. At times, we are called to do the work of planting seeds, doing small things that are seemingly insignificant, sometimes almost invisible. We don't see the results of what we're doing. We plant these seeds in faith, though we might never see the results this side of eternity. At other times, we might be called to the work of watering seeds that are already planted. We do this work of nourishing and coming alongside those who have gone before us. In this work of planning and watering alike, it is God who ultimately gives the growth. We are co-laborers who come alongside the God who has been at work since the very beginning of creation. We partner with those good things that God is already doing in our midst. We work with faith, trusting that God will continue to do even greater things than these. What a gift it is to be called to do this work of building God's kingdom together. What a gift it is to know that we are co-laborers in this mission. And more than anything, what a gift it is to know that God is working alongside us as well. This group project is sure to succeed because God is the one who is making things grow. So we are freed from the pressure of facing this mission alone. Instead, we face it together as fellow servants of God. We are co-laborers, always working together to bring God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And I want to close this um, sermon this morning by offering a prayer that captures Paul's message in our passage. It's a prayer I return to often. I think I initially came across it in the summer of 2015 when I was um, interning as a hospital chaplain. And from the very first moment I heard it, it stuck with me. Um, especially when I'm feeling overwhelmed by the weight of the world's needs. It's attributed to lots of different people, Oscar Romero, Pope Francis, Ken Untner. He's the one in the, the bulletin, the little image in the bulletin, um, quotes him as the one who spoke these words. 
Um, there are even others who are named as potential people who said this prayer or spoke it in a, a sermon or um, letter. But regardless of whoever spoke these words, I pray that they will be a gift to you like they have been to me. Um, it's from a, a prayer poem entitled Prophets of a Future Not Our Own. Um, it's listed on the Council of Catholic Bith Bishops website. Um, so I will close with these words from Prophets of a Future Not Our Own. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future not our own. Amen.